Turn with us tonight to Leviticus chapter number one. Leviticus chapter number one. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Chapter number one. Um, we're going to we're going to mind the Lord tonight. I'll just say that uh, as I have prayed about this several times in um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, or I don't remember, maybe it's three weeks ago now. I was as I was preparing for a message. I uh, it, I got back into the tenth chapter of Leviticus, and I was. God was the Holy Spirit just opening my heart to some things in Leviticus, and and it was seems like as I was as I was there, the Spirit of God began to speak to me. So I made myself a note of it and just uh, thought I'd get back to it a little later. Well, it was the very next day, and uh, God began to deal with me about uh, this book, and so I have spent the last two and three weeks probably off and on. Uh, really trying to dig deeper into this book. I'll be honest with you, I've never spent much time in it. You may have, right? You may be that person that just really been into uh, Exodus, Leviticus, and uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But, uh, you know, I love Genesis and all of that, that that's in Genesis. And the Exodus story is certainly full as God led them out. And there's so many beautiful pictures of Christ in Exodus. But when it got to Leviticus, uh, for most of my adult life anyway, it just kind of felt like I, I couldn't get it. I knew what it was about, but I just I wasn't really, wasn't really hitting me. And well, God's opened my heart to this. And so I'm going to try to obey him. Now, I'm not going to make you any promises because uh, some of you might get excited that I'm just going to teach a long time. I don't know how long this will go. I mean, it's going to go tonight for sure, just so you got that. But um, th- that we, may, we may go through the entire book of Leviticus. And uh, if some of you are checking out already saying, yeah, you're right, it's a boring book, let's not do this. Um, I promise you I would not be doing this if the Holy Ghost of God hadn't have touched me and pressed me. Because uh, I said this earlier, it's out of my comfort zone. Teaching's not. I, I love to teach and I, I, I cherish every opportunity to teach. God knows that and, and, uh, and I'm supposed to be apt to teach. Um, what, I am, what I am very sensitive about is every service we have, I want to be very careful that if there's a lost person here, I do not want them to get out of here without an invitation. Yeah. And so I, I remain sensitive about making certain that we mind God in every circumstance so that no one gets away, right? Uh, if somebody comes in here and God wants me to preach, and, and I'm going to preach, right? So... Because their soul is what's at stake, and that's important. But uh, I also believe we need to understand this book, and, and it will open up your eyes concerning a large number of spiritual truths that are clear to us in the New Testament. So I think you'll get it as we get to it. And so if you'll just hang on, uh, I think it'll bless you whether you want blessed or not. Okay, I think that this is that kind of book. As I started studying, there's, there's one man that I go back to a lot of times just for his opinion. He's been dead for a long time, but when I was in college, I, I, would, um, ever, ever, I, I always took the earliest classes there were, and 650 was the earliest class you could take at UT at the time, and, and so I was always out early, right, because I had to go to class. I ain't like some of you cats that got to go to college, and that's all you did. Right? I went to college in the morning, and I worked till 10 o'clock that night. So we didn't starve to death. And so, but, but I'd, I'd be driving early, and uh, J. Vernon McGee, come on. One of them, yeah, me too. Well, that's what that, I, was a, I mean, I was a young man, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, and I listened to him every morning as I went to, went to school. And uh, so that's, a, that's the one I go back to. He's got a... He's got a, a broadcast, a Bible broadcast. You can listen to the teaching of the Word of God and go through the entire Bible in five years. Uh, that's how they do it, uh, and it's all recorded. It's an app now, right? It's all cool now. If you just hit a button, you can hear it all. Back then, you had to tune into the AM station and right, make sure you drove the right angles. Um, but J. Vernon McGee, and, and so 
I thought a couple of three weeks ago, I'm just going to go back and listen to the first chapter of, of Leviticus. And turns out that J. Vernon McGee didn't even teach the first chapter of Leviticus. He taught the whole time on the importance of Leviticus. The entire session. 22-minute sessions, you know, because they're 30-minute radio spots. And uh, the, entire, the entire thing was him giving an introduction to Leviticus. And uh, I think that was God's way of opening my eyes that I've probably been um, in, in the least foolish for many years and avoided some of these things that seemed like they were just more rules and rituals and ceremonies and stuff that don't apply to me, right? Because I'm not a Jew, right? And so those things that were specifically to him, uh, I just didn't yield myself to the Scripture. But I want to start us tonight in, with, with the important thing, and I will remind us of this as we go along. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Romans 15, verse number 4. Now, if you've got a highlighter tonight, this is one of them that you'll want to highlight because every time that you pass this, read this, look at this again, let it be a reminder to you that the first 29 books, um, let's see, how many books are in the Old Testament? 27 plus, anyway, the, the Old Testament has a purpose. And the Apostle Paul gives us that purpose and declares its importance to us. So if you think that there is any section of the Old Testament Scripture that is not relevant, I'm going to challenge your thinking as we begin to, to learn and, and, and teach this book of Leviticus that it is all important. Romans chapter 15, verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, meaning all of those things that are written before the New Testament, the Old Testament, whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now, so the Apostle Paul has been very clear. Now, let me say this. If there, if there was only one Scripture in the Bible that pointed us back to the Old Testament, I would absolutely confidently tell you 100% to trust that one Scripture. I don't need to, right? Amen? I don't need three. I don't need four. If the Word of God says it one time, is it true or not true? But there's more. <laughs> Right, there's more than one. There's actually several times. I've kept it short to try to keep this moving along. But may I say to you tonight that everything that was written aforetime was written for our learning. Now, turn with us to one more scripture, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 4 through 6. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6, right after Romans. You're close. Romans 15, just a few pages, and you'll be at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 4 through 6. Now, the Apostle Paul's telling about an Old Testament story. He's telling about the Exodus. And he says this, And did, speaking of the children of Israel in the wilderness, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. Now, if you go back into Exodus and you read that, what were they drinking? Water. From a rock, okay? And if you go back and read it, that's what it says. It was water from a rock. But Paul's saying is that it has a spiritual meaning. That those things that you see in the Old Testament are shadows and types of those things that will come in the New Testament. One man said it like this. He said, if all I had was the Old Testament, it really wouldn't mean anything to me. But now that I know Christ and have experienced Christ and, can, and, can, and know him in my heart through the New Testament, now suddenly everything about the Old Testament starts to light up. Because what it was saying in the Old Testament, it was all pointing us to Christ. Even what you thought about that boring book, Leviticus. It was all pointing to Christ. And I think you'll see that as we look from page to page. But what he said, he said, and did all drink that same spiritual drink, for they drank 
of the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Now, is that what Exodus says? No. No, that's not what Exodus said. Exodus tells us of a rock and the water they got from it. And yet what Paul is saying is, look, let me explain to you what Exodus was, was really saying. Now that we know who the rock is, now that we know who Christ is, now that we have drunk from that spiritual fountain, now when I go back and see that spiritual rock, that's what, what Paul said, it was that spiritual rock, that spiritual drink. And he said, guess what? Everywhere they went, it followed them. Amen. Doesn't that mean something to you today? Everywhere you go, Christ is with you. That spiritual rock is with you. That spiritual drink that you need, it's right there. Amen. You don't have to come back to church to get it. It follows you wherever you go. And that's what Paul was saying. He said, listen, all that they were going through, that was spiritual. That, was, that had a spiritual light. Another man said it like this. Well, let me finish the scripture. You're all looking at it and saying, hurry up with that one. So, And that rock was Christ, look at the next verse, but with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, listen to what he said here, verse number 6. He said, now these things were our examples. To the intent, we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now, I think that was just one exception, right? There's multiple passages of New Testament scriptures that point backwards, right? Did anybody read Isaiah 53? Everybody do understand that has a spiritual message in it, right? You do understand that Psalms 23 has a spiritual relevance, amen? But imagine not knowing Christ. Then what does Psalms 23 really mean, right? You could go through that and you could say, okay, that was a great poem. That was, that was exceptional literature, But when you come to know the good shepherd for yourself, suddenly you're going back to Psalms and say, oh, yeah, that is good, right? I see what he's saying now. One man said it like this, concerning the Old Testament. Now, trust me, listen, we may not even get to verse number two tonight, but I want to do what he, I want to help us get into why this is important, right? Because if I come back next week or, Well, the week after that, and there's only three of you here, I'm going to know that you didn't get the picture. You missed what God has in store for us. There is a deepness to this, and there is an importance to this. One man said, and and when I was listening to Jay Vernon McGee, he said he was a Dr. Kellogg. He'd been dead for decades at least. But he said, Dr. Kellogg says that the book of Leviticus is the single most important book in the entire Bible. And I thought, wow. Wow. That is incredible that a man would say that. And, and J. Vernon McGee even said this. He said, you know, I, I really thought he was saying it tongue in cheek. Right? You know, he was just saying, oh, yeah, yeah. The best one, and, and didn't really mean it. He said until, he said, I personally started digging into this book, and I recognized that everything we believe is born-again believers, foundationally, you will find in Leviticus. And he said, I suddenly recognized that through the things that was told to the people of God to do. In the book of Leviticus, he said, I could eradicate every schism and cult in the world today with this book. That's pretty extraordinary. That's pretty extraordinary. That's fascinating to say the least for us, right? We're all mature Christians. Most of us are mature Christians. We've been reading our Bibles for years, and now somebody's standing up here and telling you, get excited about Leviticus, and you're saying, okay, I'm going to try. But you're telling me that somehow all that God said concerning how he expected to be worshipped is going to affect me, yeah. Yeah. I love this picture of the Old Testament, and I don't even remember where I heard it or I'd give him credit, but I love this picture. He said the Old Testament is like a well-furnished room. You just can't see what's in it till you turn the light on. Ain't that beautiful? Huh? That's what it is. That's what it is. Genesis 
all the way to Malachi. It is a well-furnished room, right, with the most elaborate and detailed furniture and pictures and types that you've ever seen. But you can't see it till you turn the light on. And that's what we got in the New Testament was the light. And when the light came on, Paul, we all scurried back to the Old Testament and said, wow, I didn't know that was there. I, hadn't, I couldn't see it. I didn't know what that meant. Now, let me remind you that all of the apostles of Jesus Christ did not have a New Testament. All they had was the Old. Amen, 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 right? All they had to preach to change and turn the world upside down was this part. And we rarely venture back into those clean white pages. We rarely go there. Well, the book of Leviticus, I believe, and I hope that you will also find is absolutely packed full of some of that wondrous, wondrous furnishings that we just can't see without Christ. So our, our, our very attempt and our, our actually 100% of our effort will be to look at all of the pages of Leviticus and find Christ on it. And as a reminder, that's how you should study all of the Old Testament is you should study it looking for Christ in it. Why? Because Paul said those are left for us for our learning and they are our examples. Now, as a man of God, as, as a preacher anyway, uh, these men can tell you, they're, they're Old Testament. Hey, you like preaching David and Goliath. Amen, amen. Right, right that's a good one. But you don't really think we preach David and Goliath because he was an underdog and won. No. No, we're preaching David and Goliath because it has a spiritual meaning. And that the Goliaths of this world are nothing to my captain. Amen. So, I, right, I could go on and on with that one, right? Because it's full of Elijah standing on karma and calling to God and him sending fire down out of heaven. You think what we're doing is just preaching to you about a, an extraordinary event where fire come down and eat up a sacrifice? No, it's the spiritual revel, relevance that we're trying to share, that we're trying to preach. Ultimately, that's what, and, and, and goodness gracious, every man of God worth his salt has been throughout the Old Testament preaching those stories, right? Amen. So Daniel in the lion's den, Right? You didn't leave that morning when you heard that message thinking, oh, Daniel's lucky, wasn't it? <laughs> no, you got the spiritual relevance. You recognized that that was Christ in that den. There's somebody in there with him. And then Daniel would go as far with, the, with his three buddies that got thrown in the fire. He told them, he said, he's in the fire. He even told us he was there. Well, that's really easy to preach, right? Because he said he's in there. Looked in there and there's four. He said, I thought we cast in three. And we did cast in three. He said, well, I see four. <laughs> Amen. That's really easy to preach the spiritual relevance of it. Now, the point is, is that all of the Old Testament Scripture is meant for our learning. And so simply what we're going to do is to try to attack these pages and recognize what as much as we can, right? I don't know that you ever exhaust any one page, verse, or book of the Bible. But, but as best as we can to, to at least open our heart and say, God, when, as we approach chapter number one and chapter number two and three and on, wh what we're expecting is for you to show us Jesus. And as a New Testament believer, I think you can, you can absolutely go into this with that frame of mind. That, that Lord, I want you to show me Christ everywhere he's supposed to be seen in this book. And so we're going to start there. All right. The author of Leviticus is Moses, right? Moses wrote five books of the Bible, and they are the first 
five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those collect, that collection of five books is called the Septuagint. Moses wrote all of those. Now, I was thinking about this a couple of days ago, and Moses wrote Genesis. That's pretty cool, ain't it? Moses wrote the account of the very beginning. Now, we know chronologically, or at least in order as they were written, Job is the oldest book of the Bible. Now, that, that's historically documented. It's not stated in the Scripture, but it's historically documented that Job was the first Old Testament or the oldest Old Testament book in the Bible. And yet, the alignment or the arrangement of these books, I believe, is Holy Spirit organized, and, and that the, the ones that Moses wrote are the first five. And uh, you say, how in the world did Moses know all that stuff? Uh, let me see if I can help you with this. Who was on top of Mount Sinai talking with God? Moses. Reckon they talked about them Ten Commandments the whole time? Now, so it's impossible for Moses to have the detail on Genesis, right? Because what we have in between Adam and Moses is a flood, <laughs> right? Which took everybody out but eight people. How did that information carry on? Well, number one, no one his family would have carried on what they had of it, right? So there would have been that witness that carried through that line and, and, and on into to what we know about Abraham's seed, but I would contend that it's, it's far more than that. Moses stood with God. Now, God never let him see him, right? You remember that story? Woo, I, that preached too, right? <laughs> right? The spiritual pictures and types all throughout the Old Testament. And that's really what we're looking for when we go back to the Old Testament is we're trying to see Christ because Christ is in all of these books. <laughs> There's even one, uh, the book of Esther. The book of Esther, you can read from the first word in the book of Esther to the end, and you will never find one time the name God. But there ain't ever been a time I ever read the book of Esther that I didn't know God behind all this, right? There is a God at work in this book. So many beautiful pictures and types and all of these things. And I, I'm just like you. I get excited about the David and Goliath stories and the three in the fire and the, da Daniel in the lion's den and, and Elijah and the, and the mountain in the cave and the still small voice and the fire coming from heaven and throw Jezebel out, right? I like all that. You know, them. hey, them's easy. And then you look at a book that is all about the rules and the rituals and the ceremonies and the feasts and the offerings and you got to do it this way and you can't do it that way. And, and uh, you know, I'm just kind of guy saying, no, oh, I want to read them exciting ones again. <laughs> and yet what I've found in the last three weeks in, in, in diving as deep as I can so far is that, is that there are spiritual pictures and types in this book friend, that speak to Christ in such a magnificent and wonderful way that we need to get it. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to teach it as long as he'll let me teach it and as far as he'll let me teach it. Maybe we get through it all, but we'll see. We're just going to trust God with that. So I pray, I pray for me because I really do want to follow God in every part of this. All right, Moses is the author of it. Fifty times in this book there is a reference made to this specifically. The Lord called unto Moses... Or the Lord spake unto Moses. In the book of Leviticus, you will find that reference 50 different times. Now, by the way, they ain't but 27 chapters. So what I'm saying is, is that that specific phrase is used as much in the book of Leviticus as it is anywhere in any other book. You say, well, what's the relevance of that? Well, let's just look at the 
term itself. And the Lord said unto Moses. Right? Number one, we've established who's speaking. And number two, we have established who he is speaking to. Now, who wrote the book? Moses did. So he certainly had information here. And we now know from the word itself where it's coming from, the Lord spake unto Moses. So when you look at just how it's written and that it is filled with that authoritative doctrine, right? You say, what are you talking about, preacher? Listen, anytime the Lord says, I said, okay, you can write that one down. That's a good one to keep. Amen? That's a good one to keep. When he says, I said, or I said unto him... Now, you better mark that one because what you can be sure of is the authoritative, declarative doctrine that is behind that came from the divine, the Holy One. And 50 times in this book, it says, And the Lord said, spake, called unto Moses. So Moses was getting his information firsthand. Amen. I can't imagine, right? I have struggled at some of this. It's blown my mind. I'm just going to have to ask Moses or the Lord one when I get to heaven. Just tell me how you did that, right? I mean, I've been working on a message for the revival the last couple of days, and, and, and I don't know how Moses stood it. You say, what are you talking about? Well, the Bible said when he come off the mountain of Sinai, they couldn't even look at him. They had to put a veil over him. They couldn't even look at him because he was blinding them. Can you imagine what the voice of God sounds like? No, you can't. No, you can't imagine what God's voice sounds like. Ask Daniel. When he heard it, on his face, passed out. I mean, unconscious. And yet Moses heard it 50 times. And the Lord spake unto Moses. That's good stuff. That is good right there. If, if anything, it is an absolute way for you to say, well, the preacher may have lost it, but I'm starting to get it. I'm going to go back and lock this door because I'm with him. Right? I'm going to hang with this because i got to believe if God said 50 times to Moses that he was fixing to tell him something... I ought to probably listen to what he said. And even though what he was saying was specifically to and for the Jewish people, what Paul tells us about those things was that they were all done for our learning. And they were all meant to be examples for us. So that when we, you, get Christ in your life and the light comes on, you're able to look back and say, Whoo, what a room is behind me. That thing is full of stuff about Jesus that I didn't know was there until the light came on. Uh, Exodus tells us of the deliverance. Oh, mercy. We done out of time. Exodus tells of the deliverance from Egypt and the start of their journey to the promised land, right? That's what Exodus was about. Exodus even takes us to Mount Sinai and we see the giving of the law and God's working with Moses and the law and and Moses comes down and he has to deal with them about the golden calf and all that. And And toward the end of Exodus, if you look at it, what you'll find is God begins to give Moses clear instructions on building him a tabernacle, right? Remember that? What Moses receives, what he records in Exodus for us, are those clear, finite, detailed instructions on every crack and crevice of that tabernacle. Right? You remember some, reading some of that and saying, why'd they put that in there about them little old rings that go around that little old socket and that other little doodad? And you're thinking, oh, is that really important? The importance of it, friend, is that God knows to the finitest of details that there are about everything else. And let's also be clear. He has an order that is not just close, but perfect. So in Exodus, 
they build the temple. You get to the end of Exodus, the very last chapter, the very last ten verses, and guess what God does to the temple that gets constructed? He comes down. He fills it. God, Scott, moves in to that place. He just instructed on them to build. God moved in, right? And it said, and it said that there was a cloud. By the day, it was over that, 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 tent, that tabernacle, a cloud by day. And he said, when the night time came, it was a fire. And he said, the children of Israel never even got ready to move until the cloud came up off that thing. They know as long as the cloud was on there, they were sitting still. But when that cloud came off, Moses said, blow the horns, time to move. That's the end of Exodus. Where you're at in Leviticus is still at the bottom of Sinai. God ain't moved. God ain't moved. God's come into the temple, and they're all camped out at the bottom of Mount Sinai. Law's been given. Temple's been built. But guess what? They don't know what to do with it. All they know is that God's in it. So what's Leviticus for? It's to teach them how to approach God. You know what that is? That's worship. Did you know you need to know how to worship properly? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You need to know how to... Do you know what, what God was teaching in Leviticus was now that he was in the building, how do I get to him? And by the way, if you didn't do it 100% perfect, they carried you out. He's a whole lot more lenient on me and you, Paul. As a matter of fact, he let us roll in here on Sundays half-hearted, half-cocked, and half-witted. And we still walk out under our own power. Now, Leviticus will open up your eyes to the fact that we probably ain't serious about worship. Well, we just got started. This is a grand adventure, I'll promise you. I don't know what God's going to, and I said that, I don't know what God's going to do with this, but I am so excited about the first part of it that I can't hardly wait to see what it all has. So hang with it. Um, we are out of time, so I'm going to close tonight and try to get through just a couple of more things. This book opens and closes at the same geographical spot. They're at the base of Mount Sinai where God gave the law, and the, the purpose of the book was to give Israel direction in how to live as a holy nation in fellowship with a holy God. It was a code of law for the total well-being of Israel, listen to this, physical, moral, and spiritual. <laughs> you say, oh my goodness, you mean we're going to talk about the physical? Yep. He addressed, look, okay, we'll get to it when we get to it, but let me just, let me just whet your appetite. With, did you know that he covers diet in Leviticus? <laughs> okay, tell us when that one is. I'm going to be sick that <laughs> Do you know God knows how we ought to eat? And I figured he did, didn't you? I just never dug deep enough in the Word to see it. It was a code of law. Okay, and you're going to find that, that Aaron's sons mess up and they, they don't follow the law as handling the fire. What did God do to them? They drug them out, buried them. And Moses walked up to Aaron and he said, you better pay attention to what just happened. As if you think you can approach God any other way. Oh, I love that, don't you? Goodness gracious. Leviticus is a code of law for the total well-being, total well-being of Israel, physical, moral, 
So he's going to give us some moral instructions in this, right? This will rub you wrong. And, and he's going to give us spiritual instruction. All right. Leviticus is the book of worship. Now, don't that make you excited? It does me. I really am excited about this because Leviticus is the book of worship. It tells us sacrifice, ceremonies, rituals, liturgies, instructions, washings, convocations, holy days, observances, conditions, and warnings that crowd this book. All of these teachings are spiritual truths for you and me. Now, preacher, are you saying to me that the that the, the law that God gave the priest concerning exactly how they were to wash their hands is applicable to me? Yes, there is a spiritual meaning to that. Right? That's so good. There's a spiritual meaning to it. And if we'll receive it, this will grow us and help us to become more mature Christians. Lastly, actually, I think we can get two more. Lastly, Leviticus reveals Christ once Christ is known. Now, if you don't know Christ, Leviticus is just going to be a bunch of rituals, ceremonies, liturgies, instructions, right? But if you know Christ, Leviticus will reveal Christ to you. The Old Testament scripture becomes clear as the lights that shine of God's Christ and his plan for mankind become clear become exposed to us through Leviticus. All right, the name Leviticus, and we'll stop on this one, is a transliteration of the title of Leviticus in the Septuagint, which was in ancient Greek. All right? So, so in the ancient Greek, the word is literally Levitica. And so that's what it's transliterated for us in the King James Version is Leviticus. Okay? But what did it mean in Hebrew? Now, that's who, who was writing it, right? It was Jews. What did the word mean in Hebrew? Leviticus is the ancient Greek transliteration, which was in the Septuagint. So it's the right way to transliterate it. But what did the Hebrew word for this book, what was it? This will blow you away. The name for the the Hebrew name for this book is And He Called. And He Called. Okay, that was good, preacher, but I don't see that relevance in that. Let me see if I can help you with it, and we're going to get out of here. The name of the book is And He Called. First thing I got to ask is, are you listening are you listening? And maybe to our hearts tonight, we ought to remind ourselves every time we come back to hear some more about Leviticus, we need to say, am I listening? Because he said he called. He said he has spoken. Am I listening? Verse 1, all right, uh, you may have closed your Bibles, sorry. If you ain't, let me read verse 1. And the Lord called. <laughs> Why not name it? And he called. That's how he started it. And 50 more times he would say the same thing. And the Lord called. And the Lord spake. And the Lord said, right? What's the point? This is a book full of what he said. We have to understand the relevance and importance of that simple truth. That the very name of the book is that he called. And he called is the very name of the book. A couple other things. He calls the people to him. And then he tells them how to come. So not only is he calling now that the tabernacle is done and he's in it. He is calling for the people now to come, but he's got to tell them how to get to him. You cannot get to God on your own. Gracious, that preach, wouldn't it? 
Just that message and he called. You can't get to God until he calls you. And not just calls you, Emily. He got to tell you how to get to him. That's good. I don't care who you are. That's good. And he called. He called his people to him and then he instructed them through this book of worship how to come into his very presence. Now, I'm going to link something for you. Turn in your Bible to Matthew 16, 18 and we're done. Matthew 16, verse number 18. Very familiar scripture. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Hang on to that part. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I just chose that one. Make this note. The term church is in the New Testament 117 times. It either says church or churches 117 times. The Greek word for church is the word called ecclesia. It's where we get the term ecclesiastical. And the word ecclesia means called out ones. I thought I'd get an amen or something out of that, but that is awesome. The term ecclesia, which you find 117 times in the New Testament, is church. When you look at Matthew 16, 18, and you get to, and upon this rock will I build my church. That is the same Greek word used 117 other times in the New Testament, and it comes from the Greek word ecclesia, and the word ecclesia means called out ones. What is the church? We're the called of God. And what did Leviticus mean? And he called. Let God dad preach. Amen. You see the spiritual relevance of this stuff? Amen, Scott. If, if, If church, I'm the church. I'm the called out one. And you are too if he has called you out. We are the church, the ecclesia of Jesus Christ. It makes sense to me. We ought to go back to the matching Old Testament book named And He Called. And just see what he said. Since we're the called one. That's good stuff. I don't care who you are. That is good. And we ain't even got to verse 2. <laughs> that is good. Well, all right, we're going to close right there. and I, uh, We will not be here next Wednesday night. We'll be at, at uh, Revival Meeting at Red Top. So my intent at this point is to carry on in Leviticus until he says otherwise. And so you pray for me and pray for that because, listen, I want every opportunity that the people of God come together to be an evangelistic one ultimately so that whoever's sitting here lost or saved, and I hope the saved get growing during this process, but if you're lost, I want them to get convicted through it. And the Holy Spirit give me discernment so that I know what's going on so that I can at least stop what I'm doing because I I like this stuff. and So I can stop and say, you know what? Let's give an invitation. So help me. Pray for me about that because I do get fired up about this stuff. This is, this is good stuff. All right. So we'll pick up right there. Um, uh, we ain't even done with the introduction, but we're close. We're getting there. We're close. This is a good book. I, I think we'll all learn a lot from it and see Christ in it. And, brother, that'll help us. That'll help us. All right. Mm-hmm.